especially nowadays, you know, our society is, is, is you know, being the best parent focused, whatever that means. Um, and what I, what I find I'm constantly asking my husband is, Dan, how do I raise, or how do we raise our children for their future, not for ours? Hmm. Right. So if I, if I'm raising my children for my future, I, I got it. Right. They, they go to Hebrew school, they go to their school, they go to soccer, they, whatever, you know, suburbia lifestyle were afforded, but that's not their future, right? That's my future, which is actually my current, but you know what I mean. And so I think a large looming question is how do I prepare them for something? A, I don't even know what I'm preparing them for, right? My husband and I were just talking a couple of days ago about what's, what's the best for them, you know, in, in terms of their safety, is it best to stay, stay planted where we know a lot of people, where we have our family? Is it best to move where they can be more surrounded by nature and away from the social collapse? And my point to him was that we, we don't, we really can't know because we don't know what future is coming for them. All we know is we don't know. I can't stop asking those questions, right? I can't stop wanting to prepare them. Yeah. Um, but I do have to stop making that the driving force because I don't know what's coming for them. I don't, and to keep them safe. And yet I can't do that now. I, I feel like I've, I've, so talk about the loss of the core. Like I really, and I think that's when I get real frantic because that is exactly what you said. It's like that very welded part of me. It has to come undone. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. It does. I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. Is there any more disturbing aspect of the conversation about the collapse of earth and human systems than how it will affect our children. Today in the Poetry of Predicament podcast, we talk collapse aware parenting with Jillian Sackett, child psychiatrist and very concerned mother, Dr. Jillian Sackett. <sighs> This is a conversation I've been looking forward to for quite a while here on the Poetry of Predicament podcast. Um, have Jill and Cantor with us today. And Jill and has been um, a participant in a number of different living resilience and safe circle and uh, deep adaptation uh, webinars and uh, online events uh, for, for some time now. And I, I've just got to say, it's been such a pleasure to have you in this circle, Jill. And, and uh, what, I, what I deeply appreciate is that you are so willing to participate fully, to open up your life and open up your disclosure of what's really going on for you. There's zero self-importance factor that I sometimes will find in myself or in others. That's especially important in the number of mental health professionals that I've interacted with. There's um, at least a self-protective factor that can show up. In other words, to try and justify a particular stance for the, the whole field of psychiatry or psychology or counseling and so on, or for one's own participation in life or how uh, a person's practice is either relevant to what's going on today or it's not. And what I mean by that is I've, I've been, able, been really blessed to be in conversations with people at the national and international level of mental health issues as they pertain to the predicaments in our world. 
again, what I've found in my conversations with you and, and your writings that you've shared and so on is uh, there's, there's just a realness that you bring. I, so I'm, I'm particularly happy and hoping that this will be as useful for other folks who will watch this podcast as it is for me. There, there's something deeply refreshing about someone who is j just doing daily life uh, at the particular level that you're in. And in a moment, I would really love it if you would introduce yourself as you would like to be known. But I can, I can mention already that, that I've learned so much by how you share about what it is to be a parent in these times. So I'm expecting that we're going to cover some important ground there. And as you mentioned, that there isn't much conversation out in the world about how to be a parent in these times, and you know, in a collapse-aware fashion. And just as a as an engaged, concerned global citizen at this point, I think you have much to say. As I look back again and and what I've heard you share and write about, so um, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation today. And um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, starting with a, a, a bit of an introduction, self-introduction, how you would like us to know you and what you'd like us to know about that daily life that I was talking about. And uh, we can pick up anywhere you'd like to pick up uh, after what you've just kind of covered in, this, in the pre-section that you were just talking about. I would just invite you to follow your instincts in this conversation. And I have questions for you if, it, if you would like <laughs> some of those, but I really trust your direction in what is current for you that you're grappling with. So Jill and welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Um, so only because um, Cantor's my maiden name, so Sackett's my last name I, I use now. So I just wanna- Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Apologize. No, that's okay. Just um, it's it's a common um, common thing. Um, so yeah, so I'm a parent of three, uh, ten, seven, and five year old, and I work as a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. I am have always recognized my privilege uh, as a white person, but also as a um, person who had had means and wealth and was raised in a you know family who never had to struggle and um and I and I and yeah um and I have always also been very globally cl like climate um concerned um I spent my childhood tormenting my poor mother um with don't use plastic and I'm not eating that meat and you know all that kind of stuff so <laughs> And she was um, amazing at listening. I, I like you said, um, you know, I'm in the throes of everything. I, I'm a parent of three small kids. I'm working, um, and it's very easy to get lost in the day to day of life, right? Take making sure my kids get their school books and making sure we've got food on the table. Um, you know, addressing my patients' uh, emotional states. Yet I can easily get s pulled away from all of it, um, and I would say not in a healthy way. Um, I, I can I can really phase kind of phase away, where I start to notice the separation between me and my my um, suburban life. I don't know if this is making any sense, so stop me if it doesn't. Because and I th I forget was it is it yeah. I think it was um, on the Emerge podcast, actually, where Joe Brewer said about how you're not, like, not feeling like you're living authentically. So there's that, you know, that hits me a lot where I feel like I'm not living authentically and, and um, how to sort of change that. And more importantly, how to change that for my kids, because that's really, again, at the heart of it all. So I mean, if, I, yeah. if I could just pause you for a second. I want to be clear. You were just describing, it sounded like you were describing the experience of from time to time, like disassociating from one or the other. And I wasn't clear which one you tend to 
kind of stay more stay more present to, which I I was understanding you to say your day to day life and the and the, all the all the aspects of that, and then this kind of impending social collapse and so on, all these other things. And I'm curious, which one, when you are having that experience, where do you find your attention landing? That's a great question. Um, in my day-to-day -day life, it's easier to just stay in the day-to-day -day life, right? Like doing all the things I need to get done. But the second I start to allow truth to come in, or reality to come in, that's when I pull, um, feel like I'm being tugged away from, I think I'm, I'm saying this right, Tug, tugged away from what feels real, if that makes sense, the day to day. But the opposite can happen too, because I can be very much present in the reality, right? The collapse and the reality and all the suffering already going on both by human and non-human species. I, I, I'm trying to answer it. It's a hard question. I, I think it really, the reality is that I can, one can feel very real and then the other can feel very real, but it's hard for me to put them both together ever. No, that's, that's a absolutely brilliant answer. I get it. And that's very much my experience as well. There are times and days and moments when I am very, very aware and really landed in my experience of my day-to-day -day life and what is actually occurring in my body and in my surroundings, all the stuff of, of my daily life. And there are times when I am far more present to something that is actually not fully present right now. It is an imagined future and it seems an inevitable future, I think we could both agree, but it is still not present. So there are well, times- it's not present for us. It right. is present for some. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Abs right. And, yeah. But, but it's still, when I tell the truth about it in my own experience, right. Right. I am not right. in Puerto Rico where there's, right. where I don't know if they'll ever recover. So I'm with you completely that this is part of the privilege and part of, of what daily life is, and I appreciate that you just, you know, answered as best you could. Sometimes you've landed and you're in your daily experience and in the right now with your kids or whatever. And there are times when the majority of your attention might land in that other reality of present and impending collapse of, of uh, earth and human systems. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and, and right. And what I have not been able to do is reconcile them, is, you know, pull them together. And I don't know if that's a reality. I, I, you know, I can't say if that's something that will ever exist, but I do think it's something that um, I kind of feel like I need for it to exist. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure how much longer I can keep walking. Um, Two, two balance beams, you know, a little bit what it feels like. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, you started out um, really covering quite a bit of ground with regard to some of the conversations that you and your husband have about um, how, how is life for you raising your children and grappling with the understandings that you have about what's going on in the world. And would you mind just kind of starting up that thread again in any place that you would like what's current for you about how those conversations are going and first i would just like to acknowledge you know your it sounds like the depth and breadth of those conversations is unique because i've heard plenty of folks who for whom one or the other in a in a couple is not as up for the conversation as the other. So it's really something that you, you two are having these kind of conversations. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, so I think, you know, in that respect, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed and lucky in a lot of ways um, with finding Dan, but um, he, he does get it. He, um, it's not somebody I have to con convince or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, I almost wish he 
I did have to convince him. I almost wish that he didn't get it so that I would start to be able to unpop my bubble, if that makes sense. You know, like, oh, well, if Dan doesn't think this is happening, then maybe I'm just, you know, um, the fact that, you know, he, he is there with me is amazing, but it's a little bit upsetting because it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> <You know? laughs> we're both on this page. Um, but of course, it's for the best because I'd be on this page whether he wasn't, you know, or was. So it's great to have somebody that I can really talk to about it. I, I don't feel like I can talk to it about it with my friends or my family. Um, the few times I try to skim that with them, I can feel all the resistance. Um, and uh, I, so I don't have a community. I mean, I, I honestly think outside of uh, my husband and um, you and Susan from the group, there's very few people that I really talk openly about all of this because no, no one, even the people I work with in the um, Climate Psychiatry Alliance, who are amazing, dedicated, awesome people. I don't think they want to hear the level where I where I sit a lot. Um, so anyhow, so the, our conversations. Um, I guess it's uh, we we watched. I had him watch that video by you know the Paul Kings North video that you had me watch. Yeah. I had him watch that as well, um, and that was sort of what opened our conversations and sort of started to shift our thinking about what we want. Uh, all that and, and honestly the internet as well. So the kids being stuck on the internet and us having to fight them off of it, we know we don't want that. So we know what we, um, it's like a sore eye opener in some respects. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about what we don't want for them. Um, and we've talked a lot about you know what the what what we do want for them, um, and it's it's hard to um, sometimes separate out good motivation versus quote unquote bad motivation, right? I want to make sure I'm doing what's right for my kids, not based out of just anxiety and fear, um, or 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 out of my own desires. Um, my husband was raised in the Rockies, so to return there seems natural, and it's always something we talked about. Um, but by being involved in all of this, I started to realize that um, it's more than, or rather, um, let me, sorry, let me back that up. What we started to realize, you know, what, what, I'm sorry, Dean, I'm sort of stumbling. What I think all of this does, this climate or the collapse is it focuses us on death, right? And, and in a good way, I don't mean in a negative way. We know in this culture, we avoid death. Um, we avoid thinking about it. We avoid, we, you know. Um, and when I was able to focus in on death, you know, the, the, the good of focusing on death is you get to step back and say, well, hey, what do I want to do with my life, right? Death is coming. What can I squeeze between there and then or between now and then? Um, and I guess what the clops did is it made me focus not on my death because I, I can tolerate my own death. It made me focus on my children's, which as any parent knows is a very intolerable thought to have to, to have to focus on, but that's sort of what the collapse is doing for me. It's making me focus on their deaths. But in doing that, it's making me realize what I do, it, it's crystallizing what I want for life for them. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm right, right? I want them to be able to walk outside and just explore and um, be submerged in nature and return to what is real, right? We think these we all think that city is real. We all think that shopping is real. We think all this stuff is real. It's because it's, you know, the, the myth we've been told, but, and, and what we've grown up in, but I want them submerged in what's actually real, which, you know, is, is Mother Earth and all the gifts she has. So my husband and I sort of started talking about that, you know, getting, getting them to where we feel like they can at least have a good life in the present since we can't guarantee them their future. And that's sort of, I guess, you know, mostly where we stay. 
but I also want to prepare their future. I get, you know, I do want them to know how to live off the land. You know, I, I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that this is purely, I want them to have the best present life they can have while they have it. I do want them to have a fighting chance as well. So when, you know, every everything falls apart, when uh, the social system, sorry, my dogs, when the social systems collapse, one second. I want them to have a fighting chance of survival, right? So I want them, I want so much for them. I mean, it, it you know, that movie, um, the, uh, what was it again? Captain Fantastic, right? Yeah. yeah. He's, 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 you know, probably verifiably a little bit nuts, but I would love to be able to give that to my children, the ability to, you know, hunt and gather, find clean water, survive, protect themselves against whatever, you know, human collapse will cause. Cause I really do think, that's where a lot of the scariness comes from, is, is from our species ourselves. And that becomes hard. That becomes where a lot of my anxiety starts to roll around and starts to, to, to spin in my head because I can't, I, I'm not Captain Fantastic, right? I can't prepare them for stuff I don't know how to do. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to survive in the wild. I don't know how to, you know, keep um, somebody from killing me. Um, I know I sound crazy right now, but... So then if I start to go there and I start to think about, oh my God, like think of this task I have in front of me of, I want for them to be prepared for all these different potentials, yeah. but I don't know how to prepare them. So then I have to come back out, you know, back to that, that resiliency zone and say, okay, wait. So come, you know, come, come away from that future that, that you're haunting yourself with and you're haunting your children with come back to now and when I come back to now it comes it, 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 it returns me back to that zone of what do I want for them and that again comes back to like that running around in nature but it's hard it's <laughs> it's it's um it's hard to not let all my fears you know command all the attention because it uh, you know again if it come if it's just me or I can handle the collapse in the respect of, for, but it, when it comes to them, it, it's, you know, it's like that mama bear sort of instinct. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I absolutely get it. And I, I have never been a parent myself, but I, I have been um, deeply engaged in working with at-risk youth. Oh, right in intensive programs for years and years, and it, which also from time to time involved the, both their parents and the youth in the same room and so on. What I'm, one part of what I'm hearing you say, it's, it's sort of easier to talk about the preparations, like being a prepper, some of the pieces you've been talking about kind of imply that like how to take care of yourself in the wilderness, how to find something to eat, how to make shelter, those sort of physicality, elements of the physicality of if, if things changed in such a way that we had to do those sorts of things and have those skills, those are skills we can learn and not many of, the, of us know them, but we can at least talk about them fairly easily. They're familiar. And what I'm also hearing you say it, I, is an area that I would assert that we don't really have a language for. It's no, and it's no less important an element of preparation. It's just one we don't even know that we don't know about it. And that that's the kind of stuff that's actually in that movie that you were just talking about, Captain Fantastic, which. I'm a huge fan. Um, there are elements of what he and his, uh, Viggo Mortensen's character and his spouse, that they trained their children in not only all those wilderness skills, but they, and, and not only just brilliant academics, you know, they really, <laughs> we should all be so gifted. Right being able to relay those things, those, those basic elements to our children in any setting, much less in the wilderness. But there was also a, 
part of what I would call the, the fabric of our beingness, that is the kind of the cultural fabric that is, is thicker for some of us than others, but we all take it for granted, even though we might not know quite how to articulate it. Like, how, how do we interact with other people? How might we describe, if we were asked, what is right relationship with other people? Uh, these are the kind of things that, that we might not even know how to articulate it, but they would show up like they showed up in that film in kind of Hollywood fashion. You know, there was a graciousness, there was an articulation, there was a, a very realness for these kids as they were interacting with people from outside the outside world. I guess what I'm headed toward is a, is a question of, it seems like part of what you're describing and so, some of the awkwardness of being a parent now, especially a very much a collapse aware set of parents as you are, there's, a, there's perhaps the most difficult part of the, that parenting that you're describing sounds like it's where that fabric is woven and where we have to really tell the truth about it starting to unravel. You know, in our culturally, it's starting to unravel in my experience. And how do we teach our children to start to reweave a new fabric? Sometimes it's called telling our, ourselves a new story, a, a new narrative, new cultural narrative, maybe exactly. a new family narrative, a new individual narrative that that is a way of reweaving the story to take the place of that fabric, that cultural fabric that's being torn up, being un, uh, unraveled right before our eyes. Does that uh, spark you to say anything? Yeah, and, 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 and two very different things. One is that I've always sort of been, and I'm sure you, you yourself, as well, I've always, you know, I've always questioned a lot of what we take as culturally normal, right? Like, do I really need a new shirt right now? Kind of, you know, like, is my old one not good enough? You know, kind of, you know, my, my family always, you know, in a lovingly way makes fun of that about me. <laughs> um, so, and I've given that to my kids a lot. You know, we do question a lot of those things. Um, and when we, they're kids, so they can question and yet still not do what they're, thinking is, you know, because they're kids and, and impulse control is hard. But, you know, when they want a new toy, we talk about, well, did it come from China? Is it just going to end up in the trash? You know, we do kind of have those sort of smaller conversations um, about sort of questioning, you know, what, what we uh, in this society think is normal, right? And then it occurred to me, like sometime, you know, a few months ago, that two things one is that everything we've been told not everything right but so much of what we've been told as a truth and this is kind of i think what you're getting at is just um it's not true right like no. it's, it's 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 a it's an idea it's a thought it's a perception um but it's not we've taken it for granted that that these things are true and and it started to hit me that so much of what I've just assumed my whole life to be real isn't, you know, and it's not my parents' fault. It's not really, you know, my teacher's fault. It's the same way they were raised, right? It's just this, this, and, and I, um, you know, just this, we're, we're given these stories and we're told they're real. And I know, I, I think I'm probably stealing from Kings North here a little bit, but um, it's hard not to, because I've been reading so much of his stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just that we start to believe these 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 myths as real stories and then someone pops that bubble and you're like oh my god i've been walking in a i i i've been you know daydreaming basically this whole time i think it struck and then there was some other point i'll get to i can't i'm trying to remember oh that, right okay so so i think it struck me i took it a little personally maybe my ego was hurt that it that struck me so hard because I felt like I always was somebody who sort of questioned the norm and sort of questioned culture and then to realize that I was only questioning 
the small little tiny parts of it. I wasn't questioning the whole thing. And to realize that even I was duped. I think when that hit me a few months ago, I was like, oh my gosh, like things I've taken so just as fundamental truths are just, there's, there's nothing really true about them. We, it's amazing to me, and this was the other point, is that how quickly we assimilate, and maybe this is a good thing, right, that humans can assimilate so well because we're going to need to, but how, you know, I, I can't answer this question, but, you know, I guess I kind of can. What has it been, like two generations, maybe three, where we've been in this country, you know, speaking as an Ameri a United States citizen or whatever, American, whatever, you know, that we've been in this country and we've created this quote unquote democracy and we've we think it's forever, right? We think this has been like such a long history of like this, you know, American culture of whatever our culture is at this point. But if you really sit back and see the whole timeline, this is a, you know, such a small dot of time, even in humanity, right? It's such a small little glimpse of time. And what's amazing to me is we've all taken this the way things are, right? This is how humans live. This is how we are. We, we live in our homes and our cars. We get to go to the supermarket. We, um, the kids go to school. We have hospitals. Like, and I mean, some of these things are amazing, right? You, I mean, but they're not necessarily real. They're one, uh, I don't know if I'm getting the right word because I'm going to stumble on the word. In, in, um, what's Incarnation, is that the word I'm looking for? They're, they're one example of how humans have lived sure. throughout the ages, right? But in our minds, or at least in my mind for so long, that was how humans lived. I mean, I knew history. It's not like I'm, you know, not, but this, you know, this, this became, this is how humans live, right? We, we drive our cars. We have our air-conditioned homes. We, it's very American of me, right, to think that this is the way things are because this is the way they are for me right now. Like. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, if, I mean, we're like the sophomores of the world. That's been a big bubble popping for me as well, is realizing that, like, this isn't real either, right? This is just another, unfortunately, though, this, the way we are living now, the way so much of the, the global industrialized economy, you know, economies of the world are living, it's one example of how life can be lived, but unfortunately it's an example that's now taking the planet with us, right? So not only is it not real because it's, or not real is a bad word, but not permanent, not like the only way. It's unfortunately also just been a horrible way, right? Like it's, it's the wrong way. <laughs> and I think that's what's also been hitting me is that like, I, I really feel on so many layers, levels sometimes that my, my, I, I sometimes feel like I'm, seeing through layers that aren't even there, if that makes sense. And I don't mean that in an egotistical way, because um, that's not how I'm trying to come off. I, I get to, I, I start to seem, you know when you get off an amusement park ride and you're dizzy? Sure. Right, so sometimes when I start to go through this, all the stuff in my head, that's how I start to feel. It's like this dizzy, weird, looking at the world. I don't know how to say that, sorry. Could, could we pause there for a second? Yeah. Because this is part of what I would call uh, the 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 calling of the times to create a language that we can with which we can articulate this world and that what you're describing i would you know when i look and map my own experience against what you're describing i i call it a liquid state yeah it's kind yeah. of a, a liminal state yeah that's exactly that's I, it yeah. i just allowed myself to get as as malleable, as permeable, as morphable as possible with the world that that makes up this business as usual world that we're all in. Right. And allow it to become more permeable and more changeable. And then also to open up a like a porous uh, membrane, if you will, into a new possibility. And the thing that I would describe, I would describe it very similarly to what you've just said. It is liquid and it is disorienting. And what, what feels like solid ground right. in the business as usual world becomes 
quicksand. Right. Yeah, quicksand. All yeah. of a sudden, it can be not just not just an up and down, get my foot stuck in it, sand thing. It's actually three dimensional, floating. Like there's so little that I can orient myself toward. So and let me what, just stop there and see. If, does that match at all what you're trying to explain? A hundred percent. And what's amazing is listening to your words describe what my words were trying to describe, and that it's that it's um. I don't want to say universal because we're only two people, <laughs> but but the fact that you could describe exactly how I feel is is I mean it, it's amazing, but it's also kind of shocking almost on some levels. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that that it's resonating for you, and I'd like to just put a pause here. I please hold on to the thread you were just talking about. I don't mean to interrupt, but I'd like to loop back to some. Yeah, sorry. No, it's no, there's no sorry. This is perfect. I love that this is iterative and I, I, this is going exactly as I was hoping it would go. So we can jump around as much as we want. And I would just like to go back to an earlier point that you made that I think is dead on is that there's really very little conversation in the world. First, there's very little conversation about this, the most important conversation in human history called the human caused collapse of earth and human systems. First, you know, there's just the blatant cornerstone of the conversation. And then even less do we talk about what it is to be a parent and to raise young children into some sort of new reality that is barely being articulated anywhere. So I, I'm since you've made that point, I've been actually forming some ideas about putting together a summit for uh, thought leaders to be able to come together and start to articulate what, so what are these folks who are brave enough to bring these issues to parenting today? How would you all articulate it? How do we bring uh, a, a some sort of body of work forth that we can resonate with and co-create so that it's not just people floating in this uncomfortable place okay. and wondering what the hell are we going to do with this and so on. Okay. So there's that. And I also just wanted to uh, kind of articulate for um, at least uh, really for the people who uh, might be new to this podcast, new to this body of work, the big part of this body of work is articulating, is creating a language that we can use to share, not just about parenting, but really about being a human being with our feet in two worlds, having one foot in the only world we've ever known, the business as usual paradigm that you're describing so beautifully, and that it is truly unraveling. You know, for anyone who has half their wits about them, it's clear this is not lasting. This is not looking good. Except for it feels like most people don't recognize that even at all. But anyhow. Yeah, hang with me. Hang with me. Because I, yeah. I don't know how to speak about uh, quite yeah. too. Right. Sorry. That, yeah. that crowd that's not quite on the same page yet in terms of awareness or willingness to be uh, engaged. Then the other foot that we all have, those of us who are collapse aware, is that there is this other world. Sometimes it's, it's figuratively called the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible, possible futures and so on. I, I have my own experience of what it is to be um, starting to articulate and starting to become more aware in this other zone and to live in this other zone. I certainly don't have the answers, but I do have a considerable amount of experience of articulation and mapping some of the area in this new world and also what it takes to become more and more aware of this other world. And so in this body of work that we're talking about, and certainly in if we create this, this summit for parenting, collapse aware parenting, there's this possibility of, of creating this a far more substantial bridge between 
the, un, the awareness of the unraveling and the discomfort of that over here, and then be just sticking our foot out into space over here where it hasn't been articulated or formed yet, and to be able to do that with a shared language. So it's not all the answers by any stretch. It's not utopia, but it's, it's a way that we can come together and share a language and co-create a language for forming some new possibilities. So thank you for letting me say those things. You, you sparked me with, with that last track that you were on. I hope I haven't taken you too far off of a thread that you'd like to continue on. And I'm wondering if anything I'm saying, you know, starting with that, that kind of um, liquid liminal state that, that really got this whole thing going, I'm wondering if there's anything more you'd like to say about what it is like to parent from and to live yeah. daily life from the occasional dive into that that liminal or um, disorienting state. So before I do that, I just do want to point out, um, because I think this will interest you. So the Child Psychiatry Alliance, we are breaking into a group of um, like climate, or excuse me, child focused group um, that we're trying to come up with like toolkits on how you talk to your kids about all of this and then how to prepare pair them in a men like a mental health way right not in a survivalist way mm -hmm. um like i'm thinking you know like different meditations or you know you're trying like richard you know um is it louv i'm so bad with names l-o-u-v um it's book you know about returning the kids being in nature so i think you know as you formulate that group a little bit more i can probably also address these guys with that because it'll be something they're interested in so i find that um being that off footing because I think that really the quicksand and the liquidation I think that's that I mean that's like to the T how it feels right so it's a very unsettling feeling and you can't get things I'm not sure yet I, I haven't figured out how to get things accomplished in that state maybe I you know will be able to but so I often quickly have to return back into business as usual so that I can, you know, make dinner or drive to work or whatever it is that requires, you know, some conscious. I find where where I where it's harder for me to shut that state down is when I'm interacting with people. I've never been the best at, you know, talking about like like chick chat. Um, I think that's why I'm a psychiatrist, right? Because I kind of go to the, the the heart of everything. But it's even harder now, like when people are talking about day to day. Oh, where'd you get that? I got that here. Or, or, you know, are you sending your kid to this blah, blah, blah? Or no, you know, that kind of sort of daily dialogue, which has its place. I don't mean to dismiss it, but I find I can't attend to it. I, I pretend to attend to it because I have to pretend to. But that's when I start to feel even more of that liquid sort of disoriented state because I don't know if it's because I can feel it right then more or because I see through it more. I'm not sure what it is. The other thing I just wanted to, to the two, two things I wanted to note was, you know, back to like this being, you know, this, us kind of buying into the myth that this is, you know, how life has always been. When you actually go back and look at all of, you know, the different forms of human living, um, and this is what I'm trying to wrestle with a little bit lately. You and I were sort of born in very fortunate times in some respect, right? We we didn't have any real big, I mean, yes, I know there were some some things, but you know, on the whole, we were very born in very safe times, or at least where where we live. But that's not most of humanity, right? Most of humanity, you couldn't guarantee safety or you, and, and most of humanity even now, right? I mean, I, you know, Syria comes to mind a lot. So it's not, I, I sometimes struggle with the fact that this isn't new for a parent to be wondering how to keep their kids safe. One of the members of your group pointed out to me, you know, all I need to do is to probably walk it, not walk into, but become involved in some urban, uh, you know, Philadelphia urban groups, and I'll see a lot of parents who have struggled with this for a long time, right? How do I keep my kids safe from the drugs, from guns? Because they're not given the advantages I was, you know, was given. And 
So I, I guess my point is sometimes that it's almost like a double bubble break. Like there's the bubble break of like, oh my God, I can't keep my kids safe. Holy cow, how is it that I have kids now this day and age when I can't guarantee them safety? Mm-hmm. And then there's the double bubble break of like, oh my God, who am I to think that that I can't get it out right, but, but, but for how did I think that that was normal even? And the reality is that if you look through most of humanity, that was just, you know, whether it's, you know, the immigrants at different times, you know, asylum seekers, um, whether it's just pre-medicine, right? Like pre-penicillin even. Um, or I'm reading about, you know, the, the Norman invasion of the England, you know, just all these things. Like there was just safety as this illusion in some respects, I guess, that I now my bubble is popping in that way too, sort of. that. You know, if, if I may, it really seems like the the thread that you're speaking about, especially if someone else, you know, suggests to you, well, just take a look at at these people in this community and how they've had to grapple with uh, the the inherent unsafety and uh, inherent racism and and oppression and other influences that that perhaps you, you and your family have not. You know, really what we're talking about, excuse me, I've got an alarm going off making noise. There we go. Uh, What it seems like is behind that thread and what that person's comment might have been saying to you, at least what I'm hearing, is each person in their own way in this conversation so often is coming from their own orientation, their own history, their own uh, understanding of this fabric of this cultural fabric we've called normal. And what we tend to do just being normal human beings is we want to make make it certain. Mm -hmm. We're certain that this is our experience over here, or we're certain about those people's experience over there. And, And I could suggest to you that you take take some lessons from those people and their experience and their certainty in that and what i was hearing you and me talk about for a few moments there was this liquid state and it doesn't uh disavow it doesn't um invalidate the points that they might have been making or you're making or for that matter what i'm making what i think we were talking about though was this willingness to be in this incredibly uncomfortable state that is at its core uncertainty. And for a right. while we were talking about it as liquid or liminal and this is disorienting and and it can be extraordinarily uncomfortable. And it seems to me that that's where the heart of what you're sharing seems to be in terms of how you're gonna live your life with your spouse, with your family, raising these children, how the hell are we gonna do this? <laughs> and what, what I wanna keep bringing us back to is that just the awareness that there is the possibility of living or experiencing, at least for brief moments, this liminal space, this liquidity, this less than certain space, and all the discomfort that comes with that. And what I hear you des- describing, where I just stopped you, and I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but I just wanted to, to add what I was, think I was hearing, which is the more facility you gain, the more time you allow yourself to to spend consciously in that liquid state, in that liminal state, in that uncertainty, the more it becomes at least familiar. And what I would say is, what I'm predicting, is that the more that people like you and me, collapse aware folks, just doing the best we can, one of the primary prepper skills, if you will, 
other than you know how to can foods and how to do a garden and so on is how to expand our capacity to be not only aware of but functional in this liminal state in between the unraveling world that we've all is all we've ever known and this world that has not yet been invented yet that has not been articulated yet so let me just stop there thank you for letting me just kind of lay out that track i'm wondering is it useful that i said what i said is it connected all with what where you were going yeah i think it's really useful in two 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 ways um one's kind of a, it's a both and or a push pull i don't know one is that i i agree i think the more i can learn to um or a parent can can learn to live in that state the better it's going to be and and as i become more familiar with that state it becomes clearer what i want for my for my you know for my kids right because again what 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 is that state that's like the losing of all the layers of what we you know have in this culture deemed real which aren't real right so if you in my mind if i want to get to reality that's getting away from all of that and getting more submerged in nature so that allows me to sort of return to that and that gives that pulls me back into the resilience right zone because when I can picture myself and my kids returning to nature, I can calm down a little bit. Yeah. But but two things that I want, one is um, it's really hard to do that as a, it's really hard to do that period, right? But it's really hard to do it as a parent because I can't explain to my children what's going on inside. I can't explain to them any more than poking little holes, right? Like again, like when I poke holes at their, their the, 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 you know, trash they want me to buy, right? Or when I, poke little holes and just because we do that doesn't make it normal or when they say you know without without missing a beat when they say can i have a glass of water i always say yes because we're lucky we have running water right so i poke holes at it but i i can't take them into this state not only would it cause them i think god only knows <laughs> you know but you know as a parent that's another really big issue right is what do i let them know right what what do i make them aware of i, I don't um their development you know they're not ready for all of this right we're not even ready for all of this right so so i can't bring them where i am which means sometimes i need to shut this down so that i can come where they are the beauty of that is if i can come where they are and they're in a place that's pure quote unquote pure i guess that's a bad word because it's it, it, it's laden with its own judgment but um at least more present more real then even if i can't take them to where this fluid disorienting state is at least i can you know ideally root them in a real state right like in in whatever real reality i can give them for whatever that means so that you know again that kind of helps solidify like your words help to solidify sort of what my husband and i were just talking about the other day of, of that we can't just be preparing them in an anxious kind of fatalistic way we we need to instead look at what we want for them for their for their lives now so that sort of helps with that. But the other thing I want to say, which, which, again, as a parent, it sort of hits me funny, is that you alluded to it, um, and, and maybe it's just my misinterpretation, but I do hear a lot of people like in this collapse world, you alluded to it, like if it's not business as usual world, then it's like some, I don't know, like the world that could be the beautiful world. I forget what you called it. Mm -hmm. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Okay, right. So. If, and maybe that's more of what you're referring to, right? Like breaking through all of these illusions and getting to the real nature. But as a parent, when I hear that, I wanna like, it feels like nails on a chalkboard because what we know is possible if we're truly, truly believing that this is collapse, right? If we are truly sitting with that and we truly sit with the fact that it's happening now, right? I mean, you see it, in, in so many of the wars we're having, you see it in the waters running where they should be frozen. You see it in all the, 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 the animals that are becoming extinct and the trees, I see it in these poor trees over here, it's too hot, they're all dying. Like that's not more beautiful, right? So I can, and it's not gonna be more beautiful for my children, no matter what. Yeah. And so when I hear people say that, and I know, I think I know what they're trying to say and I get it, right? Like shattering all the, 
the false layers and, and, and just being nature as it's intended and in being in that more beautiful space we're trying to visualize, I do understand the use of it, but it's also like, it just pierces because I feel like it's, um, it's in itself a denial. It's like in itself, it is denying the, the, the calamity of it all, you know? And I think as adults, we can do that because our, 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 our lives are on the other side of, 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 of everything anyway. Um, but as a parent and you, and you address and you, you, you go there for your child and it's not more beautiful. I mean, it, it's more beautiful if it's real, right? The, the beauty's in the realness, but yeah. it's ugly. And it's, it, it, every time I hear that, I just like, I want to like this person who I've been listening to, right? Talking and they're saying all these amazing things and I'm learning so much. And then they say something like that. And I almost want to like punch them. <laughs> like my guttural reaction is very visceral. Yeah. Yeah, just to go way back to the beginning, I think before we turned on the recorder for this particular conversation, I was acknowledging you for that that level of realness right there. That that's I've been hearing that from you since really the first session that you attended. You know, in in the various things that that uh, we offer here, and that realness, that sobriety is. You know, I, I resonate with what you're saying completely. That this, the whole notion of being able to do some sort of spiritual bypass mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to ha have a, a more um, friendly demeanor that people can be around and feel less uncomfortable around it. I've just never been that person. I've always been the person that's been too intense or too angry or too something. So it's it's not news to me that that now I've taken on this particular line of work to be talking about this conversation all the time. And I I agree with you that the whole notion that this would primarily be called the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, when absolutely for years running now and it's just getting worse every metric that I look at is getting worse. I, I, I can't in good faith use those words. So I just wanted to validate what you're saying there and let you know I'm, I'm with you on the same page. And I guess for the folks who are listening to this conversation, I would invite us all to, to take take particular um, informed journeys into that land of sobriety that you're talking about. I don't know that we can, that any of us can take it all the time to take, you know, all those measures of how screwed up things are all the time. I think it will definitely crush a spirit after a certain amount of time, but there is um, something absolutely essential about living in and telling the truth. And I think there's something ridiculously difficult about being a parent while having that kind of sober reality in your experience. You know, what's age appropriate and how do you convey it? And how do you keep beauty in their experience? Because you want them to have beauty in their experience and on and on the list goes. So thank you so much for sharing the fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we might be coming toward the end of this particular envelope of our conversation. And I'm, I'm uh, already hoping against hope that this is not our last podcast interview that we do because there this has only caused more conversations for me I, I just I'm already you know writing madly writing notes here in this conversation about the next one and the next I'm wondering if there's anything you've been doing this work this inner work that sometimes is called deep adaptation these days you've been really taking it on to what is it as a woman, what is it as a person, what is it as a parent, as a mental health professional? 
I'm wondering, is there anything that you could just share from your heart to ours who are listening to you? Is there anything that you can offer that has brought your heart a little, um, a little more peace, a little more grace in this impossible conversation? You know, I'm always the first to doubt myself. I'm always the first to, and this is going somewhere, to um, downplay that I, I have strengths or have things to add. But what I recognize is I'm not an expert in any of this, right? I'm not an expert parent. I'm not an expert child psychiatrist. I'm not an expert uh, deep adaptation, or, you know, deep adaptation person. I'm not, but I have the advantage of having all of it, right? So I understand a little bit of development. I understand a little bit of, you know, the struggles of, of parenting. I, even with all of that, it's hard, right? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with the right words. It's, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that for everybody out there, I think the most honest thing we can say is that we just don't know. You know, there's just so much we don't, we don't know. Um, and that's the other thing that keeps, I keep realizing is that with everything I learn, every, every question answered, there's 40 more questions that pop up, right? So, and I think we're all just, those of us who are trying to be honest, at least, we got to also be, you know, fair to ourselves, right? And in, in knowing that we just don't, we don't know what to do. I think, you, you know, you, you've mentioned this a lot that having a community is really important in all of this work. So I guess, you know, I just want to stress that. Yeah. But I don't actually, you don't know, have much of a community at that. So um, it's, it's a lonely, it's a lonely place to be. Yeah. I don't know if any of that made any kind of, yeah. Yeah. For me, there's no sorry there. I just so appreciate the, uh, again, your, your willingness to, to go right to what's real for you in this process in a moment by moment way in this conversation. I'm so, so pleased that we've had this time to be able to cover this ground. And um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I, I've now got a whole page full of ideas and notes just from this conversation to possibly create a, an online summit about collapse aware parenting and you know bring, bringing together thought leaders, people who are just brave enough to be both collapse aware and parents at this time and uh, ask that we just share, share whatever we can as we hang out together in this liquid state and then parent from that liquid state. You, it looks like you wanted to say something. I guess just for people, you know, like you're saying, right, so the summit, what I'm visualizing for the summit is, is people really being not just in it, right, not just in the depths of it all, not just, but, but really honest. And I think that's, that's the hardest part, right, is just being really honest about all of this, how much we don't know, how much we do know. And I think that's where a lot of us get lost is, but I think as a parent, that's like the least we can do. Yeah, but it takes immense courage, an unraveling business as usual culture that is all we've ever known. And that's the only ground of being that any of us have learned about parenting or learned about being a human being from is from the middle of this business as usual paradigm. So it does take immense courage to generate a new truth, a right. truth that is really fiercely committed to speaking what's so now. Right. That includes sharing warts and all, the, <laughs> the grief, the fear, the uncertainty. So again, just I so appreciate your willingness to offer those pieces of your reality with us today. And uh, whenever we get a chance to be together, I so appreciate that. Jillian, is there anything else that you would like to say to just wrap up today? 
Um, just thank you, Dean. Um, I, I know I've said it before, but I really, becoming aware of all of this was hard enough and scary enough, um, obviously, right? But I think if I didn't find you and your in, in that group, but specifically just all the teachings you gave me and your words and all the links to everything, I would be really floating out there lost. Um, mm probably not in an okay way either, I would argue. I think I would not be okay. Yeah. Um, so I just, I really, I, I owe you a lot and I'm very grateful to you, so thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that lovely note, um, I'm gonna wrap it up this time. And uh, before you know it, you're gonna have an email knocking on your door uh, suggesting the next time we talk about, um, let's do some serious talking about this summit. Let's put this thing together. Yeah, that would be, I absolutely, like I'm all in. So whatever you need from me. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. John, again, thank you so much. Uh, get back to your family and all right. get those tablets out of their hands and, yeah. <laughs> and go have some fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.